We turn now to local breaking news. An employee from the city's water department died while repairing a water system valve. The valve was located in an underground valve vault that was approximately five feet deep. The employee was performing a valve repair when the accident occurred and then became trapped in the vault. Thank you. As the vault flooded, an attendant outside the vault flagged down a police car for help. The fire department arrived within minutes and began rescue efforts. Come on, Katie, it's time for school. Love you. After 47 minutes, the employee was pulled from the flooded vault and then transported to a local level one trauma center where he was pronounced dead from drowning. Turning now to weather. A cold front is blowing in and we have some rain in store. The forecast is coming up next. Stay tuned. Do you know what this is about? No clue. I just know they called everyone in. My guess is about what happened yesterday. Hector, they said on the radio that it was a valve repair. To fix a leaking valve. We do those types of repairs all the time. It could have been you or me down there. It could have been us. I know. I keep thinking about it too. Hey guys, good morning. By now you've probably already heard about the tragedy that occurred yesterday at our neighboring community's water department. Some of you may even know the people involved. I've asked you here today because we need to prevent something like this from ever happening again. I don't care if you've been here for two weeks or 20 years. We're going to go through all the proper procedures and protocols so you can be as safe as possible when you're out in the field. Any questions? Okay, let's get started. We all know underground work is dangerous and each situation has its own set of hazards. It could be traffic, confined spaces, bad weather, even hazardous energy. And speaking of hazardous energy, before you even set foot on a job site, you need to know if you have the right equipment to control or shut down the energy. This includes hydraulic energy in the water distribution system. How's it going, guys? I'm gonna be your supervisor on today's job. When you say shut down the energy, are you talking about performing a lockout, tagout? Because I thought that was only for electricity. It's more than just electricity, but I'll touch on that in a few minutes. Let's back up a little bit right now, and I need to tell you what you're gonna to need to enter a space in the first place. So we're all familiar with PPE, four gas meters, and fans. These are all essential parts of the entry procedure. What else? What about a full body harness? Yeah, what else? You should have a davit system. Excellent, that's right. Full body harnesses and the davit system are critical for safe entry, as well as the potential non-entry rescue of entrance. All right, that stuff aside, what else am I missing? A permit? Exactly. You need to know if a permit's required before entering a confined space. Nothing can move forward without it. So what else? What else am I missing? Your team. Look guys, it's not just about tools and permits. You need to know what everyone on your team is doing. You need to know who the authorized entrant is. You need to know the entry supervisor. You need to know the intendant. The other thing you need is a rescue plan, and everyone, and I mean everyone on your team, should know it inside and out. Because in the event of an emergency, you only have seconds to react. All right, let's talk some more about confined spaces. First off, confined spaces and permit-required confined spaces are not the same. 
As many of you know, a confined space is large enough and configured for an employee to enter and perform assigned work. And as you've probably seen firsthand, these spaces have limited points of entry and exit. They are not designed for continuous occupancy. Okay, who can give me some examples? Tanks and vessels. Silos and storage bins. What about hoppers, vaults, and pits? All of those are correct. Now, it's important to know that some of these spaces can also be classified as permit require confined spaces. So let's talk about those. Okay, so permit spaces. These spaces contain or have the potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere. They could contain a material that has the potential to engulf an entrant. I'm talking about water, liquids, grains, and other small particles. They may also have an internal configuration that can trap or asphyxiate an entrant. Things like inwardly converging walls or floors that slope downward and taper to smaller cross sections. In addition, they can contain other recognized serious safety or health hazards, including electrical lines. A confined space only needs to meet one of those criteria for it to be classified as a permit required confined space. Now, Employers are the ones required to evaluate each space to determine what requires a permit, and then develop a written permit confined space program as needed. Okay, now let's talk more about permits. A permit is required for entry into permit required confined space vaults and other spaces. That means your entry supervisor must initiate a confined space entry permit for entry and or work to be performed in permit required confined spaces. No work can happen without one. How does my supervisor initiate the permit? They need to define a few things. First, the confined space you'll be entering. Second, why you're entering the space. And third, the names of every single entrant and attendant. There's also a time span on the permit form. Can anyone tell me how long a permit's good for? Yeah. One shift, up to 12 hours. Exactly. You'll need to make sure that training requirements for every single participant have been met and are current before entering. An entry procedure will then be developed before you enter the confined space. All right, let me ask you guys a question. What's one of the most dangerous things you can't see? You're breathing it. A hazardous atmosphere can affect the very air that you breathe. That's why proper air testing is critical in confined spaces and other public work settings, including excavations. What kind of hazards are we talking about here? Can I answer that? Mm -hmm. It's important to check for hazardous atmosphere in a permit required confined space. We use the four gas meter to check for the hazardous atmosphere. So Hector, what are you looking for here? First, I check for oxygen deficiency. If I get a reading of less than 19.5%, then we have a problem. Do you also have to check for oxygen enrichment levels? Yeah, those read greater than 23.5%, and there's flammable gas or vapor that's greater than 10% LEL. What's LEL? Lower explosive limit. There's also LFL, which stands for lower flammable limit. What about carbon monoxide? Yep, our four gas meter also checks for hydrogen sulfide and carbon monoxide. Remember guys, the atmosphere down there can change at any time. We need to closely monitor conditions throughout the entire repair and check all levels from start to finish. Hector, what's the oxygen level now? 20.5%. Excellent. Does airborne combustible dust count? It can literally cause explosions. Oh, and toxic contaminants. Correct. But hazards in permit required confined spaces aren't restricted to the air or atmosphere. But what are some of the other kinds of hazards we should be looking out for when on a job? I'm thinking mechanical and electrical. Yep, what else? Thermal and chemical. Those two. Anything else on the list? What about hydraulic, like pressure from water mains? That's right. And don't forget about potential energy. This includes static and dynamic head from stormwater and water pressure. With so much stuff to worry about, how are we supposed to do our jobs? By doing something I heard someone mention earlier, lockout, tagout. Yeah, that was me. Ah, thanks, Rick. That's great. Why don't you fill us all in? 
Well, as you guys know, lockout tagout procedures are specific to the facility being worked on. You can't just lock out a water distribution system, so you also have to use a tagout procedure. Yes, great. Tagouts are required for water main facilities when the work involves more than just a visual inspection. And it's essential for controlling hazardous energy. That's why everyone in this room has to have proper training and lockout tagout procedures have to be carefully documented. Look guys, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Controlling hazardous energy isn't easy. If it was, we wouldn't all be sitting here today. The more careful the planning, the safer the job site. Okay, let's take a quick break and come back in 15 to finish up. Hey guys. Hey, so we have a question. Sure, what's up? We wanted to ask about attendance. Mm-hmm. We want to make sure that when we go on a job together that we're covered, whether one of us is the attendant or someone else is with us. Okay, sure. Let's talk about it. Well, as you guys know, an attendant needs to be assigned before you can enter a confined space where a permit is required. And they have to be properly trained and know exactly what their role is. So Mike, Let's just say we're on the job site and you're Andy's attendant. Okay, Hector, first you need to know the hazards of the space we're about to work on. Second, you need to watch for any potential symptoms Andy may have if he's exposed to those hazards. Like what? Well, possible changes in his behavior. Things like fatigue, confusion, and changes in his breathing. And the only way to do that is by continuously monitoring Andy and anyone else in the space. Are you okay down there? All good, just dropped my wrench. Got it. Oh, and let's get something straight right up front. An attendant should always remain outside the space unless they're relieved by another attendant. Wait, so how can I know what's going on with Andy if I can't see him? That's where your walkie-talkies come into play. You'll need to communicate with Andy and anyone else in the space to monitor their status and let them know if they need to evacuate. Okay, so is checking on Andy all I'd be doing at this point? That's just part of it. Attendants need to monitor what's going on inside and outside the space to make sure it's safe for entrants to remain inside. That's why you can't go in with Andy. Andy, we got some bad weather coming. Make your way out. The very second that something isn't safe, you need to order him to evacuate the space. Okay, looks like everyone's back. I was just talking with Mike and Hector about the importance of attendance and knowing when to evacuate. What happens when entrants aren't able to evacuate? That's where the rescue plan comes in. Non-entry rescue occurs when the attendant or other personnel retrieve the entrant with a winch and lifeline. Entry rescue requires a trained team to enter a confined space and remove the entrant from the confined space. When I say train team, I'm talking about specially trained personnel such as fire departments or special rescue services. This is not for you or your attendants to try. The attendant should never enter the space under any circumstances. Let me reiterate that. Public Works employees should not attempt to perform any entry rescue. Okay, so let's wrap this up. At the end of the day, safety is the single most important part of every job we do, no exceptions. So this means investing in training and equipment, staying up to date on regulations and procedures, and everyone in this room being fully committed to our safety program, including me. That means attending training, being part of development and implementation, and of course, asking questions. This includes permit required confined space programs, and then we all need to apply what we learn on the job. Sounds good, but what happens when we need to work fast? Safety comes before speed, always. There needs to be sufficient time allowed to finish the job safely. That means no rushing. And everyone on the team needs to be patient while new procedures are being developed and learned. It's okay if the job takes a little longer while people are learning to work more safely. Okay, but what if we run into something on the job that's new or we haven't been trained on yet? Look, if you don't understand something, aren't sure how to proceed, or think something might be unsafe, Stop immediately and contact your supervisor. 
No one is expected to do this alone, and safety is all of our responsibility. Look, guys, no one said our jobs would be easy, but with the right steps and safeguards in place, we can all get home to our families at the end of the day. That's what it's all about.